standing for the invocation. Kindly remain standing for the invocation. Prayer is our invitation to God to intervene in the affairs of earth. It is our request for him to work his ways in this world. I now request Ms. Yarini to lead us in prayer with a blissful song.
That was indeed a soulful singing. Thank you, Yarini. Ladies and gentlemen, next we'll be paying floral tribute to Mr. Shyam Kotari, followed by lighting of the lamp. I now request Reverend Father A.M. Francis Jayapati, the rector, to come to the desk for offering floral tribute and to light the lamp. Reverend Father Rector is paying floral tribute. I invite Mrs. Meena Kotari and Mr. Arjun to pay floral tribute. I request Mrs. Meena Kotari and Arjun Kotari to please light the lamp. And I request Dr. G. Viswanathan, President of Loyola Alumni Association, to pay the tribute. I invite Mr. N. Ram, Hindu, to pay the tribute. I invite Mr. Vengat Raja and Mr. C.K. Ranganathan to pay the floral tribute. Mr. Vengat Raja and Mr. C.K. Ranganathan to pay the floral tribute. Mr. T. Kumar, classmate of Mr. Shyam Kotari, to pay the tribute. Invite Dr. Sita Raman to come onto the desk for paying floral tribute. Thank you, dignitary. I now invite Reverend Dr. M. Aroke Sami Xavier S.J., the principal, to welcome the August gathering. A very pleasant good morning to you all. On behalf of the Jesuit management and the Alumni Association, I am very delighted to welcome you all, dear alumni. I cordially welcome Dr. G. Vishwanathan, the president of the Loyola Alumni Association. A very special welcome to the speaker of the day, Dr. R. Sita Raman. CEO of Doha Bank, Qatar. I welcome you, sir, 
and I welcome Mrs. Sita Raman. Welcome you, madam. I specially welcome Ms. Nina Kothari, wife of Mr. Shyam Kothari, Ajun Kothari, son of Mr. Shyam Kothari, relatives, friends, and batchmates of Mr. Shyam Kothari to the function. The management acknowledges your love for the college and appreciates this gesture of love, which would continuously promote intellectual rigor in an academic institution. It is a moment of pride for the college to have you, dear illustrious alumni and celebrities who come from different walks of life from various parts of India and abroad. The honorable judges, Justice M.M. Sundaresh and Justice Baridasan, able administrators, dedicated executive officers, committed police officials, eminent educationists and scientists, prominent captains of industries, businessmen and entrepreneurs, acclaimed journalists, committed press and media persons who are present here for the inauguration of Sri Shyam Kothari Endowment Lecture. I welcome the executive members of Loyola College, Loyola Alumni Association, who have been toiling for the past three months to make this Alumni Day a successful and a memorable one. Your contribution to the college has been commendable. It is with your constant support that the college has been able to achieve great heights. Welcome. I welcome all the special guests who are here to participate in this endowment lecture. I sincerely welcome our beloved former for the rectors, secretaries, principals, and former professors who labored with love in this holy ground. I extend a very warm welcome to our officials, HODs, and professors. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for your warm words of welcome. I now request Reverend Father A.M. Francis Jayapati, S.A., the rector, to inaugurate the endowment lecture. Good morning. We are gathered here this morning to initiate a series of endowment lectures, which will be an annual feature in memory of Mr. Badra Shyam Kothari, an illustrious alumnus of the college, personally the first non-Jesuit that I met on the day I arrived in Loyola to take charge as rector of this college. Father K. Amal, my predecessor, introduced me to him. Of course, he was accompanied by his ever-present friend, Kandishwaran. What struck me in the very first meeting was a magnanimous spirit, a friendliness, and a quick connection that he could make with me in the very first moments that we met. Shyam Kothari was a student of this college, and the degree that he carries for his life is the only degree that he got from this college. And he always left his spirit and his affection for this college well known and never hidden. From this beginning, he went to, to his father's business and he expanded it, expanded it with great acumen and with great business sense 
and much more importantly, with great humanity. What grew with him was not only his business, what grew with him was wider knowledge, improvement of education, concern for environment. So I think his spirit, though physically is absent from us, lingers and hovers over not only his family, which is represented here by his dear wife, Nina, and his son, Arjun, over his alma mater as well. If you know Shyam, he would, in board meetings, make a point of making sure of the health of the many trees that he planted in various industrial campuses that he had. So when we proclaimed the greening of Loyola as a theme three years ago, I somehow feel his presence and his spirit was an impetus to this initiative. And today we see that we are three big initiatives that have taken shape in Loyola. One is the rainwater harvesting pits, which is more than 60 in the campus, which protected us from the floods in 2015. We have the sewage treatment plant, which cleans up more than one and a half lakhs of liters of water every day. We have a biogas plant which just inaugurated an hour ago, and we have the solar energy plant project that is on its inception. He was also a great educationist, so he didn't carry around degrees, but he carried a process of learning and supporting learning. He has supported a number of schools. He has a trust which runs a school for in the rural areas. And he has supported Loyola, his alma mater, very generously and at an opportune moment. Not only did he initiate the process of renovating the church, which is the centerpiece of the college and the symbol of the college, has helped a countless number of students with scholarships. He initiated the concept of the commerce block. He initiated and completed the seminar hall that we have for all our official meetings. He was always a pioneering spirit, a spirit that ventured into new areas and opportunities. When Dr. Manmohan Singh introduced economic reforms, he saw the little window opening on the mutual funds and greatly jumped to it, developed it, and now mutual funds has become a common word among a household name, a household word in many quarters. Much before CSR was decreed by the government, he set aside a certain portion of the profit that he had for the benefit and the development of education, of the poor, of uh, road making, or rural roads, or the electrification. And this CSR concept came too late for something that has already been there in the heart and in the actions and deeds of Mr. Shyam Kothari. In that sense, he quietly has imbibed of many of the values that Loyola has been wanting to instill in their students and we quietly went about doing it without bothering it to name as CSR funds or a donation or green initiative. A actions speak louder than words. He was involved with the development of the Northwest University in the States, and till his demise, he was a member of the board of government of the Northwest University. A great indeed is his honor because this membership signifies and stands for the great sense of where our education system should be going, what type of education should be granted to students, and what sort of facilities should be created as a vision that he has been able to generate and crystallize 
and he kept on influencing in whatever arena that he could speak and whatever spheres that he could influence. He was honorary consul for Austria in Chennai till his last breath. He has also been on the board of many governing bodies, including our Labour Academic Council of Loyola College and of Sankara Netralaya. And he has not only strengthened and enhanced his business, but he was also a pioneer in starting India's first and largest PIB plant at Manali, which still holds its position in the able hands of his son. It is the wish of the family that he should be remembered in Loyola, and remembered in a way which is befitting Sham Kothari's personality and his life. So we came up with this idea of an endowment lecture, which will open new vistas, new possibilities, and new horizons. And the first lecture is going to be delivered by a person, a kindred spirit, Dr. R. Sitaram. And he's going to talk on a topic which is very timely and topical, not only because of Dokalam, but also because of the long history of association that we Indians have had with China starting some 200 years before the Christian era. Most of us in the school history would have learned of Hans Young Kan Sui, I don't get the name to be pronounced correctly because I never learned Chinese, who visited India, who visited Nalanda, who has made a record of his various travels. And where he mentions one little item, that in the Sawat Valley, he found a monastery with 18,000 Buddhist monks. When I looked at it, I said, today, the world over, all the Jesuits put together do not count more than 17,000. So it, it is a historical detail of which we need to take note of also as the connection that China has had with India, where he has come right down to Kanjiburam and has left records of his visit to Kanjiburam. So it is in this context, I am delighted to inaugurate the endowment lecture in the name of Sri Shyam Kothari, and very happy that is the first lecture will be on Indo-China economic relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I'd like to welcome Reverend Dr. Lazar, Secretary, to introduce the Chief Guest to us. Good morning to all of you. I now have the pleasant task of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Arsita Raman, the Chief Executive Officer of Doha Bank. He is a prominent personality in the banking industry throughout the Middle East. He is also an economic, economic expert who has achieved remarkable success for his contribution to banking, trade, investment, economics, environment, social responsibility, philanthropy, and charity. He is a chartered accountant and holds a certificate in IT systems and corporate management whilst being a gold medalist in his graduation 
Bachelor of Commerce. He is a recipient of multiple doctorates from leading universities of the world, including a PhD in Global Governance by a European University, a PhD in Green Banking and Sustainability from Sri Sri University, Doctorate of Laws by Washington College for his unique and valuable contribution to society in the field of banking and knowledge management. A doctorate of honoris causa from European University for his contribution to global governance and social responsibility. A doctor of philosophy honorary by Arts and Science and Technology University, Lebanon for his valuable contribution to banking and finance. Dr. Sita Raman was recognized and conferred by the government of India with the prestigious Pravasi Bharatiya Saman Award, the highest honor conferred on overseas Indians by the government of India. Sri Pranab Bugaji, former president of India, handed over the award citation and the gold medallion to Dr. Sita Raman. He recently received the Global Governance Award in Renewable Energy 2017 by the Energy and Environment Foundation from Honorable Piyush Goyal, Minister of State with the Independent Charge for Power, Coal, New and Renewable Energy and Mines, Government of India, for his vision, leadership, outstanding contribution, and for demonstrating excellence in the renewable energy sector. He was honored with the Green Economy Visionary Award in 2016 by Union of Arab Banks for his outstanding contribution of close to two decades towards environment-friendly activities, thereby promoting green economies. He has also been conferred with the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Banker Middle East in, in May 2015 to honor his contribution to the industry, not only as the leader of one of the Middle East's most dynamic banks, but also for his personal contribution to the greater understanding of economic development of the region and his support for the environment and the business. He has been named best CEO in, in Middle East three times in the last 10 years and world leader business person. He has received the Business Man of the Year Award in 2015 from Qatar Today, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Institute of Directors at the Global Summit 2014, and the Man of the Year at IAIR Awards 2014. A leading top-tier bank CEO, he has transformed Doha Bank as one of the best performing banks in the Middle East region. He is a high-profile economist and is invited on a regular basis by international media such as BBC, CNN, Fox, CNBC, Sky News, ALC, Bloomberg to share his views. For more rich information on his achievements, you may please visit Dr. Sita Raman's website, www.sitaraman.org. We are indeed privileged to have him in our midst today. He will speak on a road map for enduring Indo-China relationship for enhanced economic growth of India. On behalf of all, I extend a warm welcome. I cordially invite Dr. Sitaram to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I invite Dr. G. Viswanathan, President of Loyola Alumni Association, to honor our Chief Guest, Dr. R. Sita Raman, with a shawl and a memento.
Thank you, sir. Over to Dr. R. Sita Raman. What a joy. What a joy to be an integral part of this illustrious institution. A president and management committee members of the Loyola College Administration and the Alumni Associations, honored guests, Mrs. Shyam Kothari, Arjun Kothari, faculty members, distinguished guests, honored guests, and ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and privilege to be an integral part of this interesting and exciting endowment lecture of an illustrious alumni, Mr. Sham Kotari's inaugural lecture. I was here at 8.45 today morning. I was asked to be an integral part of the inauguration of the biogas plant. I admire the green vision of this institution. With the changing face of the world, the world at large is at stake in terms of global growth and global sustainability. Elimination of extreme poverty, gender equality, universal health care, universal education, global warming and climate change, these are not ordinary issues. These are extraordinary issues. With the rising temperature, rising sea levels, animal extinction, carbon neutral society we need to create. The mission to create a better world and better citizenship is not an option. Institutions of this caliber is engaged in converting the institution itself as a green institution. That's the roadmap I was showcased and showcased an important activity of converting the, the kitchen waste into biogas. I saw the concept as well as the actuals uh, fitting recognition to individuals who are aspirant for creating better world to society. My compliments to loyal administration. We live in a changing world. Extraordinary set of changes happening in the world. The world at large is going through global sustainability momentum. Next week we have the International Monetary Fund meeting where the global economists global bankers are getting together in the name of International Monetary Fund, both in terms of fiscal as well as monetary makeup, to create convergence to have sustainability for global growth. We are struggling. Even after eight years of global financial crisis, financial economies are still converting as real. Real economies are redefining the scope and performance. Communism has changed. Capitalism is altercating its form and substance. Mixed economies are, are said to be performing. If you look at the uh, global growth, the economic outlook which came from IMF in July, it's supposed to be turning out 3.5 percent, possibly, possibly next year 3.6 percent. What we recognize as a funding crisis moved into a, a solvency crisis today, it's a sovereign crisis. The world at large is going through. Politics and economics is not converging in substance. We have seen the stagnation in real order in the advanced economies. Advanced economies are grossly underperforming. We need to understand countries like the United States, which was responsible for the, the investment banks issuing a triple A gilded securities, world over, investors have placed the money, and the subprime crisis was visibly showcased in the form of Bass Terms and Lehman Brothers. America has invented money supply process, what you call quantitative easing. By printing money, improving the money supply, we can increase the liquidity and we can bring up the housing market. Housing market is improving. Jobless claims are reducing. Inflation still, they are struggling. Interest rates have been revised three times in the last eight months. Quantitative easing model, which has pumped trillions of dollars across the globe. The hard money was transcending borders. Today, you have seen the financial markets become gambling grounds. We have seen the reflection of hard money chasing the housing market, stock markets, currency market. Again, currency market itself is a manipulation. Extraordinary set of gambling happening, speculation happening in the financial markets. 
but America is on course to recover. That's why they suspended the quantitative easing. But the economy still is not having a sustainable uh, development. Housing market recovery is not the only solution. They were aiming at 3%. Today, global growth is less than 2009. If America can print money, Bank of England can print money. That's what they did. Again, if Bank of England and America can print money, European Central Bank can, should print money. Enlarged fraternity, as defined by Maastricht Treaty, is enriching itself by printing additional money. But they have a design error. While the monetary policy is centralized, fiscal policy is decentralized, and countries and continents we have lived beyond their means, they are facing a bigger issue in terms of convergence. It's not confined to Greece or Portugal or Italy or Spain. Euro, as, as an enlarged federation, has got its own structural issues. Fiscal discipline is not there. If America can print money, Europe can print money, and again, Bank of England can print, me, print money. Japan started realizing they have to print money, pulling out of technical recessions. In 2012, you have Abenomics was invented, and they started lifting their economy. The currency was weakening, while the export-driven economies like India, rather uh, China or Japan, were propelling to uh, some amount of trade. This is not universal values in terms of global governance. Unless you have universal standard in terms of accounting, valuation, securitization, or even currency administrations, you are not going to have a global sustainability. In the midst, a functional democracy like India is, is redefining and transforming its, its own substance. We have seen the reflection of the quantitative easing model. By printing money, you are weakening the currency. Currency is said to be the barometer of an economy. If you start artificially administering a currency, you have a bigger reflection in terms of the currency management. And that is precisely the reason why the financial markets I said as gambling grounds. Stock markets are highly volatile in substance. It, it defies the logic in substance. It is not anymore the fundamentals of the economy which reflects in this stock position in terms of pricing index. That's the reality. We have also seen financial economies are con converting as real. But conversion is still on. So how do you do it? You started inflating the economy. That's what everyone in the world is doing. Leave alone China. China is very ambitious in terms of currency management. Artificially, they are administering since 2009. It was parity linked to dollar. And again, since 2008, 2009, they are administering the currency to promote value advantage in terms of trade. And that is precisely the imbalance in terms of global space. Gone are the days when Chinese economy used to have over 30 years, over 10%, 9 to 10% growth. Now they have slowed down. If I look at the bigger picture in terms of macroeconomic fundamentals, the global growth is supposed to be 3.5% to 3.6%, which I said less than 2008. Global trade, which is supposed to be double of the GDP of global growth, today is half of the, half of the global growth. Last year, 2016, we have reported 1.6% is the global trade. So global trade is not moving in the right direction. Global economics is not really moving in the direction. If you look at a split in terms of advanced economies, they are performing 2% in aggregate terms. America is said to be doing around between 2 to 2.1%. Euro is 1.7%. Japan is supposed to be doing between 1.4 to 1.6 percent. With the advent of Brexit, the referendum in June, June 23rd last year, you have bigger issues at stake in UK. Gone are the days where they were reporting over 2 percent. Now they are slowing down to 1.2 to 1.3 percent. Essentially, in aggregate terms, they are reporting around 2 percent. Advanced economies were the economic engine of the world. 60 percent of the incremental productivity has come from the Advanced economies, rather emerging markets, they are reporting now around 4.5 to 4.6. Gone are the days where they were propelling around 6 to 7 percent. Now, if you look at the, the aggregate growth, it's between 4.5 to 4.6 percent. 
China is slowing down, as I said. It is supposed to be reporting around 6.7 percent. On average, I am saying there is a possibility between 6.5 to 7 percent, provided they have structural reforms in terms of monetary as well as a fiscal prudence. When it comes to India as a functional democracy, as I said, it's an extraordinary set of opportunity. We have seen the demographic dividend. We have seen the transformation in real order in the last three years. But demonetization, execution was an error. But conceptually, financial inclusion is not an option. With the changing dynamics, if you have to reduce the difference between haves and have-nots, you have to bring in financial inclusion as a substance. And that's precisely the reason demonetization was profoundly thought through. I'll come to it in a minute. What are the execution errors? While transparency is a better perspective in terms of Indian administration, we have seen the reflection of the last quarter. The execution error has resulted in slowing down Indian economy to 5.7 percent. But India can come out of it. The fiscal and monetary prudence can be aligned. The structural reforms which they brought in, including GST, can be executed to professional respects. We can bring the sense of balance in the coming days. I will explain to you in a few minutes. So if you look at the bigger picture, India is still can report between 7 to 7.2 percent, while China is to be, is to be reporting around 6.5 to 7 percent. Russia was in contraction last year on account of the Crimea annexation. They were slowing down for the last two years. They can report around 1 to 1.2 percent. South Africa is in political limbo now. They should be reporting around 1 percent. Brazil is still is an opportunity wither away. They are going to report this year between 0.5 to 0.75 percent. That's an indication in aggregate terms. Emerging markets should be reporting 4.5 to 4.7 percent. And that's the scene we are seeing. In the midst, Middle East, North Africa, rather Afghanistan and Pakistan, they have a different set of a challenge. The Hindu chief editor, Mr. Ram, was talking about the changing dynamics in the Gulf. We have an extraordinary set of changes. 45% of the world oil, 20-25% of the world gas comes from this place. We have a different set of evolution since 1981. The Gulf Cooperation Council, the six states put together, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, were hosting an extraordinary set of momentum with the oil price costing over $100. They were hosting over one-third of the global sovereign wealth almost around 2.5 to 2.7 trillion. That's gone. Now GCC is, is broken into two pieces now. We have, we have a principle-centered uh, difference in terms of social justice, functional democracy, and freedom. The monarchs are not converging in, in terms of overall substance, how to have foreign policy cohesively to be administered. We have seen the reflection since June and countries like Qatar, where I come from, we have a struggling economic momentum. The blockade on, for, since 5th of June has triggered more confusion. We have land, air, and sea connectivities have been completely scissored but within the Gulf Cooperating Council, and we have a bigger challenge to have financial stability in substance. So this is the world you're seeing today. This is the character of the world today. These are the scorecards you can interpret yourself. Where are we taking? While we re recognize global sustainability is important to have sustainable development agenda, while we have pronounced in 2000 as Millennium Development Goals, in 2015, September, it was redefined as sustainable development. To have sustainable development, you need to have a global a partnership in the making. And that's where conceptual and synergistic ideologies needs to get evolved. It's not happening. There's lack of convergence in between the politics and economics. The new American administration has got a different connotations to every single point of productivity and performance. While Trump administration is not agreeing in terms of global trade, the Trans-Pacific Partnership has been rescinded. Over six to seven years, it was a hard work. 16 to 17 countries coming together, laboring the whole convergence process and evolve Trans-Pacific Partnership. Today, 
It is not in action. America is dealing in, in substance. They want a fair trade in addition to being a fair trade. Possibly, in the wisdom of Trump administration, they may evolve in bilateral terms, they can negotiate the deals. Brexit itself is a major challenge for us to recognize. Within the EU Federation, the bigger advantage they have had, EU, uh, rather, UK had within the EU definition is, is need to be tested in real order whether bilateral opportunities can be created in terms of trade. World at large is at stake in terms of trade. World at large is also at stake in terms of global growth, global banking in the midst. Ideally, credit expansion in the world today is not a double of the, again, GDP. It is ideally, it's in double of the GDP percentage like trade, you should have credit expansion. And that's the global submission. Performing economies always produce twice of the GDP as credit expansion. And that is at stake. When we recognize the light switch regulation has failed, we need to bring in consumer protection as a way forward. We need to recognize, we need to bring in more trust and confidence to the common man. And that's precisely the reason investment banks have been uh, redefining the overall business model. Meanwhile, we also have anti-money laundering and combating financing terrorism is a major thrust by global governance. The world at large, with a universal framework set in and getting redefined time and again with the accounting framework, and also banking fraternity is an extraordinary confusion to see what sort of convergence is required between a credit and a economic momentum. That's the universal norms. Unless you have universal norms set in in terms of synergistic values, we are not going to have global banking in order. Investment banks apart, commercial banking is now coming back to basics. A typical a bank which runs with shareholders' money can have seven to eight times as ideal norm for deposits, and they can have access to shareholders' equity between 10 to 12 times. And that's the, the performance yardstick we measured hitherto. And that's getting changed. Your corporate banking is getting into different with your retail banking, which was consumer-centric, individual-centric, with the digital ecosystems getting redefined, transaction-based processing are coming into digital ecosystems, and now the customer convenience is the name of the game, and digital economies are redefining the business model for financial inclusion, and that's where India was right in recognizing this change and bringing the Prime Minister's Dandan Dan Yojana scheme for financial inclusion. There's nothing wrong with the, with the inclusion. Over 300 a million are the banking, uh, in the banking channel now. That's what we hear. But a global banking today is getting redefined. Global supervisory alignment, integrated regulation, is the name of the game. And that is getting challenged. Because, again, a country has to power itself with, with the allied principles for supervisory framework while we have a regulatory realignment required between the banking and insurance and stock markets and, and regulatory authorities, we have not seen a consensus between various regulators. That has created more confusions in many parts of the world, including India. We have seen the reflection between a fiscal policy and monetary policy a difference. They have to align to have substance. And that's what the, the game change we are seeing in the banking scene. And this is the world at large. In the midst, how the Indian economy and China economy can develop a roadmap. Let's understand the Indian economy. Indian economy is, is a powerhouse we need to understand, which can take it to the next level in the next few years' time. While G7 was predicting the global growth, gone are the days. As I said, the emerging economies, E7 has are redefining the game. In year 2000, it was half of the G7. In 2015, it's equal to a G7. By 2050, that's what the economic pundits are saying, it will be double of the, the G7. That's the kind of opportunity we have. But to gain that momentum, to have this acceleration, to have this 
validation in real order and bringing gross welfare to the mass, we need to instill structural reforms. We need to align the policy framework. Politics and economics have to converge in substance. While well, India is, is, a, is a great story, we can recognize India is getting globalized in terms of, in terms of functional economics. It's a bigger opportunity. India as a country, 35 years before when I left, on account of subsistence, I was uh, going to the Gulf. India was different. Today, your passport is respected and recognized. We are proud to be Indians. Our heritage, our culture, our value systems are second to none. We get the right respects in any part of the world. Non-resident Indians and persons of Indian origin is a country by itself, nearly 30 million people doing an outstanding job, whether it's corporate or, or in business. Extraordinary set of you know, commitments have been demonstrated by Indians. India is a great story. Indian food, food is transcending borders. Indian film industry is transcending borders, whether Hollywood or Bollywood or Tollywood or Kollywood, it's transcending borders. We have seen the right reflection. Indian music is transcending borders. Indian literatures are transcending borders. Indian culture is transcending today. Universal values are getting created right from yoga. United Nations, 167 countries coming together, endorsing this science as a character depiction of how India is getting the prominence in terms of substance and substantive compliance. There's nothing, uh, you know, we have to be proud of the evolutions what we are seeing today. But at the same time, we also have to look at with cautious optimism. While we recognize India is a telling story, we are performing in every pocket. In terms of science, we are going to moon and Mars. In satellite terms, we have reached the milestones. We are a nuclear power. We are second to none in terms of, you know, in terms of cements. We are second in terms of jewel, jewelry and precious stones. We are number one. Ninety-five percent of the the cuttings are done in Surat. We have seen the reflection of. Indian everywhere. Our market momentum itself is a bigger opportunity for uh, global economies to recognize they need to build this partnership. Where else you will have uh, such an young population, as I said, dividend, demographic dividend is an opportunity for us to recognize. Where else you will have a country with full substance. This century belongs to India pro professionally if you administer. Politically, if you converge with the changing dynamics in the world, India can can conquer the rest of the world. There's no question about it. We have a right to say we are no more a soft power. We recognize that. We also recognize the challenges which we have in our midst. But China, you have to look at in comparison. While we are $2.5 trillion economy, our current account deficit can be measured and managed and controlled, 36 billion. It's easily measurable. It's in act this is IMF prediction. In actual terms, it's different. Marginally, we can come out of the uh, crisis. We have fiscal consolidation required. Again, our fiscal deficit is measurable, 3.5%. Our inflation is under control. Our interest rates are uh, coming to terms. Our uh, monetary policy is aligning with the changing dynamics. That's not the end by itself. But how do you uh, re-regulate how do you make sure absolute convergence in terms of execution for the uh, policy framework which we have pronounced? Some of the liberalized market measures which we have taken. Investment climate has improved. Trillions of dollars were coming in from the rest of the world to China. If you look at America, America was topping in the list in terms of inward investments. Then came China, Hong Kong and mainland put together. They were receiving the investments. India is now standing at global ranking number seven. Extraordinary set of changes happening in terms of consumer confidence, investors' confidence around the world. We have seen the reflection. There's no question about it. We have to necessarily understand how do we bring in value streaming to compete with a giant like China? What we can learn out of China? If you look at, in comparison, the Chinese economy, they are nearing 12 trillion. Of course, the currency was artificially administered. Of course, it is not a democracy, but they had still adopted free market dynamics. You have to understand these changing dynamics. China was business friendly. Ram said, it had been there 30, 40 times in the last 30, 35 years. I have an office I've been administering over the last 15 years in China. 
we have we are operating in 16 countries right from sydney to toronto i had an office in in us which i closed i had a under wall street was my branch i closed it the cost of compliance was prohibitive but if you look at the chinese economy their reserves are trillions but their gross to the gdp is wild their shadow banking system is wild with the advent of human rights and human dignity they have a challenge which they have to recognize and they have to define the solutions when people empowerment people power becomes the ultimate power you have to understand a functional democracy here which is moderate in its, its substance which is diverse and which is plural in its identity which has got an extraordinary set of alignment still has to compete with an economy which is a giant in size there are enough economic prediction to see that china will be the driving force their political ambition is visible their territorial ambition is visible their global leadership is getting eminent we have seen the reflection in the silk road hard and you know the their evolution in the last 10 years through their politburo in terms of policy makeups what the gap which america is enlisting in terms of global governance they are catching up the gap they recognize they are building the road map today as they are evolving to be a fine combination to do business their economic fundamentals are strong they have investable surplus which they can put it across the globe they are also becoming ambitious to integrate in terms of global leadership their eminence in in, in security global security is visible their eminence in terms of emerging economies whether africa or, or the gulf is visible they are building the partnership while i said american administration was giving up the trees be tpp china is talking about globalization china is building bridges in bangladesh china is building port in pakistan they are interconnecting africa from southern china we have seen the reflection of the trade momentum getting back in track they have realized a couple of years before shadow banking is is going to be a killer they recognize their rights which regulation has not worked in terms of their overall uh, financial powerhouse but they are redefining the transformation the structural realignment is coming up their ambitions to reignite their partnership is evolving while america is not endorsing cop 21 this is a sad story it's a very sad story they are not recognizing the global warming and climate change china is recognizing the 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 global warming and climate change if you look at the bigger picture china is emitting the over 29% of the uh, carbon uh, carbon dioxide in the world most polluted continent we have seen the reflection we have seen the reflection of united states between two administration 15% of the global carbon emission comes from united states 10% comes from euro and 7.2% comes from india now india is in the right direction the solar council uh, uh, what the prime minister has pronounced in in cop 21 they have been consistent in terms of whether it's whether it is mexico or cancun or doha round in cop 18 or in warsa in cop 19 or peru in cop 20 or paris in cop 21 they are unified in their mission to bring in a more carbon neutral systems whether it's water management or waste management we have to instill right kind of uh, a green economic moment and that's what china is doing now china is focusing in real order to create carbon neutral systems their commitment to solar alliance is visible their commitment to global banking they are creating an alternate to imf we have seen the brics together evolving a, con a new development bank and that concept is again a st structurally akin to the overall uh, global leadership what china is envisaging if you look at the bigger picture china is in the right direction they have defined the problem they know india was competing to a large extent excelling in terms of overall policy framework they know india is a functional democracy they know their limitations now a country of such size 1.4 billion population with 12 trillion is going to really transform and take the global leadership it's very much visible if you look at in bilateral terms we have bigger challenge than in china we have over 70 71 billion is a bilateral trade it's all to their advantage if i look at the split 10 billion is our export 
61 billion is, is an import for India. And there's no way with the protectionist policies in terms of trade, you can export your drugs. We have been endorsed by, in terms of generic drugs by Americans, Europe, FDA has cleared it. We have bigger opportunity to, uh, to export. They should come to terms. And that's what the politicians are engaged in. The new commerce minister, who is a friend of mine, Mr. Suresh Prabhu, is, is talking about the primary stone for him is to bring this relationship partnership into, uh, you know, uh, as a bilateral opportunity. We have to bring this to the table. Otherwise, can you stop importing from China? The answer is no. You will be making the biggest mistakes. And we all know we have bigger opportunities in terms of export if it is generic drugs. We have bigger opportunities in terms of the IT, if it is a source of outsourcing or I mean, there be, something is happening here and there, but that's not the end by itself. We have bigger opportunities in terms of investments, not only trade. We have to counterbalance by bringing trade and investments together. Their commitment is not enough. If you look at net balance of payment, we are going to make 51 billion every year, it will be bought out. And that's the kind of uh, serious, uh, you know, seriousness in the relationship we have to identify, recognize the challenge. So pragmatic steps are required to bring in bilateral trade to fair trade. Pragmatic steps are required to have bilateral investments. While our intellectual property is second to none, we have to bring in industrial investments, investment partnership, joint ventures to counterbalance this. And uh, that's what the, the, the Prime Minister is attempting to do since 2014. We have seen the reflection of his uh, characteristics. We have seen the, the engagement, economic engagement is forcing on, but it's not still coming to terms. We have to get our values in turn, then we have a better balance to strike. If you look at the investment commitment China has made, it's just 20 billion. China and, and Japan were creating their own, you know, they are coming to support our infrastructure creations. We need trillions of dollars in terms of infrastructure creation. But countries like Japan is transparent enough to come forward. And if you look at the bilateral trade versus their investment, it's in battle balance. And their commitment and the political will is visible. Here, you have to exist with neighbors. You have, there's no point in creating a sensation on the framework. There's no reason for us to go out of line in terms of defense expenditure. So while the foreign policy makeup has to be aligned with our eminence in the global functional makeup, getting a role in Security Council, getting a, a universal identity as our brand equity, and getting the a global partnership stronger than ever, we also have to recognize the real change which is happening in China, and politics and economics have to converge. While we have a differentiated vision between the various political parties, the will has to come in substance. The consensus has to be evolved in, in, in terms of economics, and the bilateral negotiation has to take place so that we reach a, a fine balance in terms of investment partnership or trade. And that's the need of the hour. We also recognize we have made mistakes even in the last three years. While we have taken extraordinary policy difference, while we have taken the legacy and started redefining it as a country to have transparency and full governance, India's financial inclusion is commendable. The telling story in the last year International Monetary Fund was financial inclusion. Telling story in the last year United Nations submission was India is emerging as a stronger power than any other country in the world. But India, we are slowing down. Some of the execution errors which I mentioned need to be ironed out. Some of the policy difference between center statesman state relationship need to be ironed out. While GST itself is a right kind of, right kind of a framework, the execution needs to be in order while we have to uh, make sure the, the, the difference in terms of, you know, the st center state's uh, productivity and performance needs to be compensated in multiple form and substance. The rates depicted is not signaling a common man's advantage universally. That's opinion. And that's what exactly we need to correct. Then we have internal integration within the framework. That needs to be ironed out. Then we also have a clear identity for us to have in terms of social justice, freedom and as a functional democracy around the world, whether it is Australia, whether it is Toronto or Canada, whether it is UK, global 
respect for India is, is getting very much valued. But China is having an extraordinary money power. China has got economic fundamentals stronger than any other country in the world today. As, as a socialistic framework, with the divergence in terms of business and investment-friendly environment, they are in a better position to have inward investments. Let's look at the financial markets. Last, this year, up to the August, they had almost 700 billion debt paper was an inward investment by international community as invested. We got 70, 71 billion last year, and perhaps we may end up in doing the same. Our investments in the last three years, since May 2014, is committed to 110 billion. That's not enough. And that's not what we visualize. Our investment, inward investment should be more. We have to come out of the, uh, the fiscal deficit. We have to have investable surplus. That's possible. That's possible, provided the, the, the policy framework, which was pronounced as a transformation policies, needs to be functionally administered by center state administrators. And that's the need of the hub. Then we have a convergence within the country. How to build this roadmap? We need to have bilateral negotiations with the different connotations. While India has, has a different say around the world, still, if you look at the veto power in the United Nations in terms of politics, still, they have better edge. United Nations last week submissions by various global uh, uh, political leaders are a real testament to what we can interpret in the coming days. We are seeing extraordinary opportunity for Chinese growth. While India's economic stagnation is being is a concern for the rest of the world. While intra-trade, intra-investments, intra-banking, intra-finance between India and China needs to be renegotiated, needs to be reset in substance, we have to recognize this is going to be a make or break situation. That's how I interpret. If you look at the, the, the opportunities we have, there is a logical fitment. If you understand the, the economics, we can renegotiate. While the global community has endorsed our generic drugs, we need to negotiate with a stronger will. We have to link, as I said, investments and trade in absolute substance. Then we have better say. And that's how we need to evolve ourselves to have better productivity, better performance, and reduce the deficit between India and China. And that's the need of the hour. If you look at some of the visible challenges we have seen where China is playing a bigger statesman role, for example, Africa. India-African relationship needs to be, again, realigned. Some of the, uh, you know, some of the counties or some of the countries within the African definitions needs to be realigned. For example, Wamu countries, Western African countries, they have a, a real say in terms of the African administration, and to a large extent in terms of monetary makeup. And we need to realign ourselves. And China is having a bigger investments in Wamu countries. Again, global partnership needs to be aligned with the, with the opportunities we have in the Gulf. The bilateral trade between India and the Gulf is over $100 billion. Now, China, with less human capital investments, we have almost 7.5 million Indians in the Gulf. Over 100 billion trade, but investments from the Gulf to India is very limited. While the investments from the Gulf, as I mentioned, over 2.3 trillion is a sovereign funds invested in multiple pockets and multiple countries. And China is excelling in terms of overall investments. And our ability to reinforce our commitment to the Gulf, and that's what exactly the Prime Minister is, is, is trying to do in the last two years. 30 years, nobody visited UAE in the Gulf. And the Prime Minister Modi has visited. He has visited uh, Saudi Arabia. He visited Qatar. He has visited, again, UAE. There is absolute commitment in terms of investment. The rest of the countries you should visit. And bilateral trade has to be linked to bilateral investments. And if you look at the bilateral investment between the Gulf and China, is, is the momentum is twice of what's happening between India and the Gulf. Imagine, we have proximity. 
we have human capital investments. Our investments are limited in terms of financial commitments from the Gulf states. And that's where, and we are also importing. Our net balance of payments is, is huge, over $60 billion for oil and gas and petrochemical. That we need to, uh, we need to come to terms. So you have extraordinary set of realignment required in terms of building this partnership in various parts of the world. As a functional democracy, both US and India is coming together. But the divergence in terms of policy makeup with the global governance, American new administration is, is envisaging, we have a concern. So it's better to build the BRIC partnership, better to come together in terms of uh, you know, banking, while they evolved the a new development bank as a BRIC bank, they need to have more investments for infrastructure creations by the Chinese government to invest in India for multiple sectors, for our airport or seaport or road or rail or renewables. We have to do it. Sustainable development we need to bring in for India. It means the BRICS or new development bank should invest more. And that's an opportunity where perhaps we have to uh, come to terms. While we also seen China is, is rebuilding its relationship with Europe, you go to Eastern Europe, look at their commitment in terms of the infra infrastructure creation. Uh, we need inward investments for invested, investment partnership from the euro itself. And that's slowed down. That's absolutely, it's not visible. So this is, this is where we have to, uh, you know, really reignite our opportunities. The global, building this global partnership, India has to realign in terms of functional making. And that's an opportunity. So you don't build a roadmap between India and, and China overnight. It's a process. The process has to be initiated in multiple form and substance. It has to be in the form of trade. It, it has to be in the form of banking. It has to be in the form of investments. It has to be in the form of banking and finance. It has to be in the form of a building global partnership, which will have direct and indirect implications in terms of foreign policy makeup and allied uh, you know, economic investment, economic engagement and investments. And this is how you have to realign, recalibrate our relationship with, with China. With these words, I once again thank the Loyola administration, Loyola alumni, for giving me these opportunities. I would like to respond any questions you have on the bigger picture be or between India and China or building this partnership. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. Such an important subject, and I should compliment the Loyola administration for giving me this opportunity. And, uh, and I should say a few words about this college. What inspired me this college is, and especially on a Gandhi Jandi day, I'm here, uh, the Green Mission. As an uh, oriental saying, if you aim at short term, you build flowers. If you aim at medium term, you build trees. If you aim at long term, that's what I think Loyola is doing over 93 years. You build humanity and human dignity. And that's precisely Royal Administration is doing my compliments to one and all. As Gandhiji says, commerce without morality, science without humanity, wealth without work, religion without sacrifice, politics without principles has got no meaning. And we, let us remember Gandhiji on this. Uh, Father Thomas was mentioning about the vision and values of this institution, the positive attitude I see, in, and the positive energy uh, was a reflection I've seen while we had this uh, coffee session. Extraordinary set of affinity among the alumni is, is, is very inspirational. I'm going to tell the story around the world, how this institution is evolving to be a fine combination to promote better world and better citizens for this world. And I thank the, the Kothari family for inviting me uh, for this illustrious uh, endowment session, and uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to submit myself on the, in front of this August gathering. Thank you once again. Any questions? Sir, my question is about uh, the recent decision uh, with respect to agreement made uh, between India and uh, Japan with regard to the bullet trains. 
Now, what do you think about the advantages, both immediate and the ultimate one, in terms of uh, transformation of the technology and with particular reference to the Indian railways? Sorry, because the issue I couldn't hear it. Now, my question is uh, on the, oh, yeah. Uh, my question is, This is with respect to the introduction of bullet trains with the, uh, after the agreement between India and Japan. Uh, what do you think will be the advantages, both immediate and then ultimate one, with respect to the development of uh, the railways in general, and, the, and then uh, overall perspective from the perspective of economy? If you look at the last. We need trillions of dollars for infrastructure creation, as I said. The projects which are pronounced is getting into investment partnership with China as well as Japan. While we are connecting very many metros, top cities, Not only railways, even smart cities. You're seeing various provinces of China. They have modernized so well their infrastructure, we can learn from them. And that is what exactly I think more and more Indian business houses should visit China and look at this province. And B2B can be enlarged in addition to G2G. They have bigger opportunities. Uh, if you look at the EPC companies operating around the world, including Gulf. Chinese companies are now overtaking Japan and Koreans in terms of construction. Their engineering excellence is visible. I think we have, we are connecting metros, we, are, we have commitment for smart cities. We need more investment partnership and engineering support from China. I think if we can create such joint ventures with a public-private partnership model, we can score well, and of course, railways, uh, there is a commitment uh, by Chinese. We can bring in more investable surplus. Uh, Chinese commitment of three to four billion is nothing. They have pronounced 20 billion, and they have visited Gujarat and Maharashtra. They haven't made big subscription to any of the projects so far. And this is where the gap is visible. And uh, in the coming days, I'm sure, we have to bring in more money. And I mean, in the absence of such investments, we are going to short circuit ourselves long term. Now, especially trade is a concern. I don't know, see the reason why they are not accepting the generic drugs in port. They are not accepting a full scale for our uh, uh, you know, technology, including outsourcing options. So there are plenty of reasons why they should have free market dynamics with India. China and India should have free market dynamics so that the value is not lopsided. It's tilted now more towards China. They need to bring in, the, you know, with a with the will. There is, there is, there we require a real commitment from China. That's my impression as such. Mr. Ram, you have a question. One area of concern for all of us, or many of us, is the internal situation unfolding in India. The kind of internal strife, attempts, deliberate attempts to exploit religion for uh, political ends, to divide people, uh, lynch mobs taking many lives, taking the law in their hands, and flagrant violations of the Constitution and the law in the name of religion. I don't want to name any particular political party in this gathering. But uh, these tendencies seem to be weakening India's internal strength tremendously. Also see the trolls on the social media. If anyone puts out a reasonable view or a contentious view, you will immediately get trolled in a most abusive, if not filthy manner. And uh, the powers that be 
are largely silent or very soft on uh, these dangerous tendencies. There's plenty of criticism of China in the press, what it does to the press and so on. But today, the malignancy in the Indian system seems to be greater. This is at least my, my opinion. Right. I'd like you to comment on it. It's, a, it's absolutely valid point. See, we, we are known for our plurality. While India is a functional democracy, I was, we are known for cooperation and coordination. The global community has got a very similar uh, reflection of what Ms. Ram has just mentioned as such. It's a cause for concern. Uh, so much of religious thrust is endangering the global image as well. We have to understand this changing dynamics. While the concerted vision has been prolific, the execution has not been to professional respects. And some of the incidents we off in the last few years we have seen and showing a blind eye towards it is, is very much a cause for concern. I, I travel on account of my professional responsibility around the world. And uh, the changing dynamics, while it was totally optimistic three, three and a half years before, today the people are cautiously optimistic because this is not a good for healthy India. And that's the impression the international community is recognizing as well. We are known for our tolerance. We know for our identity as, as oneness. I wish the policymakers are not having short-sighted vision. They need to have a long-term commitment to build humanity and human dignity. India is known for its tolerance, and they have to hold this great values for our long-term prosperity. And I, I couldn't disagree. I fully endorse your view. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Chinese investments in our neighboring countries have an underlying strategic element in them. Whether it's a port of Hamandota or uh, Gwada port, any Chinese investment in the neighborhood has an underlying strategic significance to the country. Their economic policy is not independent of their long-term uh, world leadership goals. In terms of economic investments into India, is that a block? And there's a second part to my question as to whether we are losing out. Our biggest uh, terms in foreign exchange earnings have been the service sector, yet we've not looked east towards the service sector. Is China open to outsourcing opportunities from India? It's not possible. The first, uh, please. You're right. If you look at the political linkage in terms of policy framework, you, know, you can visibly interpret it. It's not a secret the Chinese are holding. They have said it, and they are reinforcing it. In whichever be the Security Council resolutions, you can read it. How they manage India neighbors, and what sort of commitment they are making and what sort of investments they are making, if you look at it, there is a political linkage. It's not core commercial. There's no, nobody can, it's not something which is not visible. It is everyone can interpret it. I think from our side, Indian side, we, we have to reinforce as a people power. I think that's the only way you can contain this. If, you can't put pro policies which are prohibitive. We cannot say we should not buy from China. It's not possible. It may not be economically advantageous first to start with, because Chinese goods are cost effective compared to the rest of the world. You can import from any part of the world, but it's not cost effective. It is cost effective for us. That's why we are going. And Chinese knows this. And whether it's outsourcing, whether it is, as I said, generic drugs, which is up, approved by everyone. Why they are not doing it? We are fourth largest in terms of volume. If they want to help us, they have to. If they want to really believe in fair trade, 
they could have done it. So I think there are two parts to this. One is their territorial ambitions are visible the South China Sea or to the neighbors. India has to be cautious. Their economic linkage with politics is 100% visible with the ultimate objective to become politically taking the leadership on spaces which they aspire for. And that is the reason their concept of neighborhood, the concept of foreign policy for India's neighborhood, their, in, their investments uh, across, in and around India is all telling stories for us to interpret what sort of a long-term plan. And mind you, with the core econometrics, by 2050, there will be the, even why to go far, in my opinion, if E7 is redefining in terms of building this partnership, in terms of BRICS itself is an enlarged fraternity now, with ASEAN and BRIC, China will be the most powerful country in the world. America will be stripped out of first rank. And India has a chance to, opportunity to enhance its global power from 7% to, to 15% by 2030. There are many extrapolation, many sides of interpretations on this. My interpretation is India has got better opportunity provided. Mind you, today, with the changing dynamics, it's one world. Territorial integrity is incidental. It's people power. Most of the migrations are economics, nothing to do with sentiments. And we have a, we are a functional democracy. We have people power. Our uh, policy makeups are in consonance with, with the changing dynamics. Nobody can deny or defy this logic. If you look at the globalization, now which is moving to anti-globalization or economic nationalization, countries like United States or even UK referendum is signaling we can be in a better position to get bigger market share, whether trade or investments, provided we have a political will, provided we have uh, our principle-centered values, including a tolerance, and our global identity should not be compromised. If we do that, we can redefine the game. We can bring a game change. And that is what the intention to start with. This new government was absolutely visible in terms of uh, global brand equity. Here is a power, here is absolute vision in terms of globalization, here is a leadership, but suddenly things are ch changing I, I, because of the reasons which Ms. Ram has mentioned and, and you're also expressing your concern. I think we should get back to principle-centered values. We have to play to our potential. We can come back and track. We can, we can coexist. We don't need to compete with China. We can coexist. Mind you, their one-child policy is really costing China. But India, with the demographic dividend, with the kind of structural transformation which we are envisaging, with the globalization of India around principle-centered values, we can be a better powerhouse than anyone else. It was on the road. Suddenly, we are facing a bumpy road. Sir, with uh, Pakistan, why China is so close and acts like a godfather to that country? What is the reason? More than India, they are very close to Pakistan and their finances. Not coming to India, going always to Pakistan. And, uh, they are the, the only godfather, it seems, to Pakistan. See, I, living in the Gulf over 35 years, I have good Pakistan friends. There's nothing wrong with P2P. People to people, if you look at, we have, they like India. If you look at the, the policy, politicians have created this gulf. And right from cricket match everywhere, we have so much repugnance pervading. 
But why China is doing? They know. They know how to contain India's economic progression, how to put roadblocks in India's economic progression. That's uh, politics, which is visible. Now, if you look at uh, not only Pakistan, now it's a, if you have so much commitment coming for Bangladesh, look at the investments which they are going to make in Bangladesh. Look at the investments they are going to make in, in China. You look at around the world, what sort of reorganization they are doing in terms of Belt Road. The, the, the new concept of yeah, yeah. Silk Route is something which is worth watching. Yeah. And, and India has to coexist. Our, we should complement our policies. This is what I'm saying throughout this discussion. It's a very different topic, very, diff you know, very uh, interesting assignment. And thanks for it, Royal, to give me this concept. But if you look at the underlying opportunity, we can coexist by a differentiated policy vision. We can map these risks, in my opinion, by engaging in economics so that we can also coexist to build gross welfare to the mass. Yeah, please. Hello. Well, uh, Dr. Sitaram, my name is Ravish. I'm a proud alumni of uh, Loyola. I've been like you in the Middle East for the last two decades. And I firmly believe that uh, as uh, the, the Indian human capital has actually built those GCC economies quite well. As an eminent economist, Dr. Sitaram, and can you tell us, or can you tell me, how could this eminent human capital build India to reach the number one position faster than what the world is predicting. Thank you. Good point. See, not only in the Gulf, Indians have shown their way. They have shown their commitment around the world. You go to any part of the world, the corporate or, or their economic engagement, which will be the profession they're engaged in, they have shown their hard work, commitment, honesty, integrity. They have gone there not only to make foreign exchange, but they are contributing for the economic development of the nation, wherever they are, it's known. Most sought, sought after human resource in the world today is Indians, and we have the strength, and we have the capacity to still spread ourselves. India is everywhere. You don't miss any India anywhere in the world today, and that's our a plus point. What, is, what has been the story in the Gulf? If you look at the we, we went there on account of economic opportunity. And uh, bilateral trade or investments apart, Indians have contributed so well, they, the Arab world, especially Gulf states where there is a maximum wealth, uh, they have economic engagement as well as political engagement mostly towards the West. Because the individual sovereignties are insured by American administration, for example, in the Gulf. You have an insurance base in Bahrain, uh, rather, naval base in Bahrain. You have a military base in Qatar. And they use India as a soft power. And that's the reality. They, you know, we know uh, Indian laborers are good. Indians are hard workers. We can give them any job. We can give, you know, they're honest in business. And, they haven't taken India over the years for serious investments. In fact, if you look at the, the contribution of Indians in the Gulf, in terms of trade, it's not Indians. It is Europe. The single largest trading partner for the Gulf is Europe. Single largest investment is again Europe. And then US. Now China. Not India. And this is where the gap was visible. I mean, when you have, in fact, when I met the Prime Minister, I mentioned to him uh, 
twice or thrice, even in the past as well as the present. He said, why can't we link a trade and investments? If you are going to pay over 60, uh, those days over 120 billion we used to pay when the oil price was over $100, why don't you predefine converting our debt into equities? Let them put investment partnership, let them, uh, you give an exit strategy. Our bureaucracy was a major reason. If you look at the Gulf investment authorities, whether Qatar investment authorities or Abu Dhabi investment authorities or Kuwait, who are all running in trillions, they will tell you, we don't have exit strategy, so much bureaucracy, we don't know uh, how it works. So that is why now the new government, Indian government now is trying to reinstill the confidence. I think we have to go a long way in ensuring we'll create a simplified procedures, single window uh, for investments. We'll minimize the bureaucracy. We will give exit strategy. The investment partnership are liberalized, incentivized. This kind of initiatives are now is taking place. The current prime minister of India has visited multiple times, uh, and he is, he is at it. One thing I can tell you, the mission sitting in the Gulf today is only concentrating on economic uh, identity. And that is a good sign. And then he knows the strength. India is not leveraged on the relationship. In spite of having so much human capital, so much trade tilted to us in favor of, rather, Gulf, we, India has not attracted investments. Now it's coming up. Let's see, this, the uh, uh, Indian Infrastructure Fund is what is being mobilized now. Some of the uh, uh, Gulf governments are placing money. So, uh, after the Indian Prime Minister visit, whether the Abu Dhabi or Qatar, or business houses are engaged in investment partnership. Things are happening now, but it's a slow pitch. Any other questions? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen, for your questions. Thank you, sir, for the insightful message on sustainable growth in terms of global economic partnership. Your talk on various sectors around the world, redefining economic policies for facilitating global convergence, specifically India and China, was indeed enlightening. In the Middle East country, an Indian, much more a Tamilian, is heading one of the fast-growing banks in the global financial landscape. No wonder he's the right person. I request Reverend Dr. A. Thomas to propose the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, friends. I deem it a great pleasure to stand before you to propose a word of thanks. The roots of all goodness lie in the soil of appreciation for goodness. Famous Dalai Lama says, the roots of all goodness lie in the soil of appreciation for goodness. I'm here to thank people of goodwill who made this endowment lecture a grand success. Friends, what brings all of us together here today is love, friendship, and the memory of Sri Shyam Kothari. <laughs> love and friendship are the embodiment of goodness Thanks a lot for gathering here for the sake of love and friendship. Today, in a special manner, I would like to thank Sri Dr. R. Sita Raman for his thought-provoking lecture on the roadmap for enduring Indo-China relationship for the economic prosperity of India. It is indeed an interesting topic that can open up the world of knowledge and understanding. And I think Dr. Sita Raman did justice to provoke our thinking and initiate an in-depth discussion. Thank you very much, sir. The scholarly input and the perspective speaks volumes about Dr. Sita Raman's depth of knowledge on the topic. Thank you very much for accepting to deliver this lecture. 
and your thoughts will continue to kindle our thought process. And Loyal is extremely happy to provide a platform to initiate the discussion in this August gathering. I take this moment to thank Mrs. Nina Kothari and Arjun Kothari for their valuable presence and participation. There are few whose footprints are worth following and they keep inspiring. Sri Shamp was one among them. This endowment lecture will continue to lay down roadmaps for future generations. Thanks for making it a possibility for Loyola to host this endowment lecture. I thank all the family members of Sri Shyam, friends, batchmates, well-wishers, and staff of Kothari Industries for coming in large numbers. Loyola values your presence and looks forward to associate with all of you in the future. I thank all the officials of Loyola College for their wholehearted support and encouragement. I thank all the Jesuit fathers, and especially former principals, rectors, and secretaries, brothers, friends, our teaching and non teaching staff for their presence and participation in this endowment lecture. And finally, I extend my heartfelt thanks to our president, Dr. G. Vishwanathan, the members of Loyal Alumni Association who have come from far and wide, even from outside the country. Many of them have traveled here on this day to spend this beautiful day with all of us. I thank each one of them for their presence and valuable participation in this endowment lecture. We thank you for your accompaniment in the entire process. Especially, I have a very special thanks to uh, Mr. Kandishwaran, who has been very much part of the whole planning and thought process. Thank you very much, Mr. Kandy. My dear friends, this day will be remembered by all of us, for not only for the beautiful lecture that we have we had today, but also the beautiful memory Sri Shyam Khodari has left among us, and that we will continue to cherish his presence and all the values that he has left among us. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Father. Kindly stand for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jaya hai Bharata bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Ravira Utkala Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Utchala Jaladhi Taranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangala